welcome to Tokyo Game Life, a Tokyo-based video game podcast focusing on Nintendo and gaming culture in Japan's capital. Your host, Mono, here to bring you a slice of gaming life from Tokyo. Kelsey Lewin joins the podcast as we chat about the Wonder Swan on its 25th anniversary. We chat about its unique legacy, the best games, an unusual pregnancy peripheral that costs thousands of dollars, and more. In the games, I take a look at the first Western release of Wrecking Crew 98 and the Japanese indie hit, The Exodate. And as always, I'll close out with a bit of news. Let's start with the feature on the Wonder Swan with Kelsey Lewin. Today's feature is about the Wonder Swan, a unique piece of Japanese gaming history that recently celebrated its 25th anniversary. Joining me to chat all about it is a special guest. So guest, please introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Kelsey Lewin. I'm the co-owner of a retro game store chain in Seattle called Pink Gorilla, and I am a self-described Wonder Swan evangelist. So mm. happy to be here. Yes, thanks for joining me. For those who maybe aren't familiar with it, let's say some groundwork. What is the Wonder Swan? Yeah, so the Wonder Swan is a late 90s, early 2000s handheld, kind of a competitor to the Game Boy, Game Boy Color, that mm. general era. It was not released in the United States. It was primarily in Japan, although it also got some releases in South Korea and some other Asian countries. It was kind of a collaboration between Koto Laboratories and Bandai. And Koto Laboratories mm. is an interesting company because it was founded by Gunpei Yokoi, the guy who mm. was heavily involved in creating the Game Boy, the Virtual Boy, the Game & Watch, all kinds of other uh well-known things from Nintendo's history. So this was his work. He unfortunately passed away before the Wonder Swan came out, but it is very, very reminiscent of his style. And there were over 200 games for it. It's a really interesting system. Yeah, I've always thought of the Wonder Swan as almost sort of a follow-up to the Tamagotchi in that Bandai hit it big with a unique electronic device. They wanted to expand on that success. And even though it was poised as a rival for the Game Boy, it obviously has a very strong Nintendo connection, like you said, through Gunpei Yokoi who is, yes, credited as the father of the Game & Watch, the Game Boy, the Ultra Hand, and many iconic games in Nintendo's history. He left Nintendo in 1996 and formed Koto, and then they worked on the Wonder Swan with Bandai. And like you mentioned before, it was released in 1999, but unfortunately, Yokoi passed away in 1997. So I am curious about the level of his involvement with the device. Do you know the background on if he pitched the Wonder Swan to Bandai, or if Bandai came to him with an idea for a handheld? That I'm actually not 100% clear on. So there's a biography about Gunpei Koi that it hasn't come out in English. There was a French translation of it that I have I have faithfully Google translated and stuff. And I've, <laughs> I've tried to learn as much as possible from that. But to be perfectly honest, like it's it's got a pretty heavy Yokoi slant to it. It's very much mm. told through his lens. And I think it's a both a great resource and possibly not entirely the whole truth on, <laughs> on mm. some of that stuff. But I mean, <laughs> right. so no, I mean, it's not super well known, I think exactly how that partnership came to be. Although Koto Laboratory was founded kind of with this very, very Yokoi-esque philosophies. And everyone who's worked there has kind of spoken of just how like how big of a tenant that sort of like lateral thinking with withered technology, his big his big philosophy and the sort of like playfulness in of old tech was mm. to Koto Laboratory. So it's the other products that they've made have all been very, like you said, like Tamagotchi esque. They've been very just like these right. fun little electronic toys that are very simple, very cheap. And by cheap I mean like literally inexpensive, not like crappy. And <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I certainly, as far as did he design the whole thing? No, absolutely not. But is his right. DNA a huge part of the design and, and how it came together and everything? Absolutely. And I think even years into the Wonder Swan, there's still things that feel very Yokoi inspired that kind of continued to live on through it. So I'm sure we'll talk about it at some point. But I mean, there was a whole like, um, early indie scene, like homebrew scene mm. in the Wonder Swan world, which was not common in the late 90s. It was <laughs> not something people really did on consoles yet. So very cool stuff that was very, I don't know, it, it feels very much like something he created, even if he was not alive for its release. Yeah, it is sort of like an alternate sequel to the Game Boy in sorts. And when you look at it, the Wonder Swan, it doesn't look like a Game Boy clone. What are some of the unique features of the Wonder Swan hardware? 
Yeah. So, I mean, just physically speaking, you've got this kind of horizontal looking console and it has what looks like way too many buttons on it to, yes. to be quite frank. So you, <laughs> yeah, so you have um you have like a little set of four up in the top left and in the bottom left and then an additional set of two on the bottom right and then like a, a start button, a power button, all of that stuff in the middle and the screen. But the reason you have these eight buttons all shoved onto the left hand side is because the Wonder Swan is actually a console that can be played both vertically and horizontally. So you have some games mm. that take advantage of the screen having this vertical capability. So it, it lends itself really well to interesting ways of interacting with the system. There's some times where you're playing a game and then it's suddenly an up and down level or whatever, as opposed to mm. a left to right level. There are three versions of the Wonder Swan. I probably should have led with that. The original Wonder Swan is just black and white, much like the Game Boy, although it has a lot more shades of gray. It's capable of a lot more shades of gray than the Game Boy is. And then you have the color, which is very Game Boy Advance-esque in a bad way, which mm. is the screen oh. <laughs> totally sucks. It's a very dark kind of difficult to see screen if you're not in good lighting. And then finally, they released something called the Swan Crystal, which basically just has a nicer screen. I mean, there's some other minor upgrades to it, but it's basically just a Wonder Swan color with a nicer screen. And much like the Game Boy Color, you have backwards compatibility there. You can play the black and white games on the colors. Uh, there are even some color games that can be played in black and white on the black and white system. So it's very reminiscent of the Game Boy line in that way. Yeah, it is kind of interesting that it can be played both vertical and horizontal. And the Nintendo Switch, there are some games where you can play the screen vertically. So Wonder Swan is kind of ahead of its time a little bit. And yeah. do you think that Nintendo maybe took some inspiration from the Wonder Swan for the Game Boy Advance, Ooh. since both are primarily horizontal devices? Yeah, I wonder. That's an interesting question. I don't. I certainly don't think Nintendo's ever said anything to that effect. Timing could have worked out there, but I think you mm. also you also have the Game Gear and right. the Lynx for that matter. I mean, there were mm. Wonder Swan was certainly not the first one to do the sort of horizontal orientation there. But you bring up a good point with the Switch because I hadn't thought about how there are some games that oh, are yeah. played vertically, and there was even that accessory made for it, so you can hold it vertically, yes. which I think <laughs> is so cool. Um, yeah, and it's it's a powerful little system, but in a very Game Boy way. Again, it's cheap. It makes use of technology that is not top of the line. There were certainly basically all the other handhelds coming out at that time had more expensive screens and all of that stuff. But the upshot was that for that original Wonder Swan, the one, the black and white one, mm -hmm. one double A battery, thirty hours yes. of life. Mm. I mean, just an insane. I mean, put that next to the Game Gear, and it's just. <laughs> It's ridiculous. It was so well optimized for truly being a handheld system as opposed to something you hold handheld, but you really need to have plugged into the wall at all times. Yeah. And that was part of Bandai's philosophy is that, okay, we're going to release something that is very, very cheap, a really good entry point into, I guess, handheld gaming. And you have that form factor and the price was cheaper. It wasn't really that much cheaper than the Game Boy at the time, but it was still like a Tamagotchi-esque attempt to get the handheld in people's hands that normally wouldn't play these types of games. It was like under 5,000 yen at launch, mm. right? I mean, the Game Boy was famously inexpensive as well, but the Wonder Swan was even less expensive. So mm. really good entry point. And because it had that Bandai connection, you have all kinds of very popular licenses and stuff that you can tie mm. in with it. So all kinds of like Gundam and One Piece and Dragon Ball and just all this anime stuff that you can do with that as well. Okay, we've touched on the hardware, but obviously the meat of the system is the games. And Wonder Swan has a pretty impressive library for only existing a few years. What would you say are some of the standout games on the device? Yeah, so I mean, I do think it depends on whether or not you speak Japanese. I don't, <laughs> right. so I am barred from a lot of the very cool RPGs and stuff on the system. Square at the time was kind of having a little bit of a feud with Nintendo, and so mm. they... <laughs> for a, a short period of time, we're like, fine, we're just going to make Wonder Swan games. And so you end <laughs> up with uh, a lot of the Final Fantasy games being remade for, for Wonder Swan, the early ones, obviously. And there's even a couple Final Fantasy special editions of the Wonder Swan color. And so there's some very cool stuff like that on it. But for someone who maybe doesn't know a lot of Japanese or none at all and who wants to get into the system, it's a fantastic system for puzzle games in particular, a couple of my favorites are Tane Omaku Tori, which is, gosh, it's kind of difficult to d explain 
game, but it is a vertically, I'm a sucker for all the vertically played games because I just think that's so (laughs) neat. It's not something you really get anywhere else. So this is a game where you are basically trying to water flowers or plants on the ground and you're trying to get these droplets of water through obstacles down to safety so that they can water the plants. It's a pretty inexpensive game. It's a very fun one. The big puzzle game on the system is Gunpei, of course, named yes. after <laughs> Pei Koi, which is a, gosh, puzzle games are hard to explain when you don't yeah. have pictures or anything. <laughs> there, You have all these different shaped lines, and you're trying to get the line from one side of the screen to the other, but they're kind of, they're sloping in different directions, they're bending in different directions, and you get higher scores the more that you can like kind of intersect and get to the next screen. And there were several Gunpei games made for the Wonder Swan. There was uh, just straight up Gunpei. There was a Atari Panda Gunpei, which is a very cute panda themed Gunpei. And then there is a, a Wonder Swan color version called Gunpei EX, which is just a little bit more dynamic and um, flashy and, and colorful and stuff. Another one of my favorites is Flash uh, Koibito Kun, which is mm. you're a little ninja trying to get people to fall in love with each other by getting hearts through different obstacles from one person to another. There's a game called Engacho, which is that one actually came out on PlayStation 1 as well. So if you don't want to deal with the Wonder Swan version, there's a, a Japanese PlayStation game. But Engacho is it's a weird one that my understanding of this phrase, and maybe you can <laughs> help me out here since you live in <laughs> Japan, is that it's something that like little boys will kind of explain. Ex- as they do something gross, like they'll say in gacho and then like fart or something like that, or <laughs> blow some boogers or something. So everyone yeah. in this game is a gross monster. There's like a flying butt. There's like a guy with big hairy armpits. I mean, it's just a very silly looking game, but it's another kind of obstacle game where you're trying to get from one side of the level to the other. I and mean, every move you make makes these weird monsters move in a puzzly way, either towards or to your right or whatever. So if you take one step forward, this monster will also take one step forward, but this other monster mm. will take one step to the left or one step to the right. And it, it's consistent. So the flying butt monster or whatever always moves two steps back when you move one step forward or something like that. But it's another just kind of fun obstacle avoidance game. And then my absolute favorite game on the system is called Rhyme Rider Kararicon, um, mm. which is made by the Vib Ribbon people so it's kind of an action uh rhythm game and you're just this cute girl in a frog outfit avoiding obstacles to the beat basically (laughs) and and defeating (laughs) enemies to the beat in a very it's a very colorful silly looking world and it's a super fun one and the the music's really good too there's also some other good like platformers and stuff on it there's klonoa games on it there's ghosts and goblins games on it there's a konami game called buffers evolution but yeah there's it's a really good system for just kind of your classic like handheld experiences that you're not going to sit down and play for four hours. You're going to mm. sit down and play for like 20 minutes. Is there any sort of visual style or core element about the games that makes you think this is emblematic of a typical Wanderswan game? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Well, I think because there's so much Bandai tie-in, definitely you can spot a Bandai Wonder Swan game from a mile away because it's mm. just it tends to all be the IP and it's all very colorful and, and anime and all of that. No, I mean I think the thing that sets at least the black and white games apart is I mean, it just looks like a, a super version of a Game Boy game. The graphics are more detailed, you get more shades of gray, I should say, and more pixels out of it. So you just get these really beautiful detailed but black and white graphics which i think is really nice because i already like the aesthetic of the game boy and it's kind of cool to just Mm. see it cranked up a few notches yeah one game that really stands out to me is that there well there's actually two games based off of junji ito's horror manga uzumaki yeah on the wonder swan and it's an adventure game and the panels from the manga are rendered really beautifully in the game and the kind of eight and 16 bit aesthetic mixed with the graphic illustrations is a really interesting mix And last year, a game came out called World of Horror that visually looks like it takes a lot of inspiration from this Uzumaki Wonderswan game. Are there any games that stand out to you as being inspired by Wonderswan games? Ooh, yeah, that's such a good question. I mean, first of all, there's a lot of future game developers that came out of the homebrew scene of the Mm. Wonderswan. I mean, literally 
some of the people, like the people who made Judgment Silver Sword, which is a game made for a competition, they're still making shoot 'em ups today. Those, those mm. guys who were making it, yeah. games for the <laughs> Wonder Swan. So that is still happening. No, but I would love to know if someone was inspired by a Wonder Swan game to create something else because mm. I'm sure it's out there. But yeah, I don't know of any in particular. It's hmm. not a system that came out in the States, so right. I can't imagine there's a ton of Americans who grew up with a <laughs> Wonder Swan game and are like, I'm going to make a game just like that someday, but right. you never know. <laughs> yeah, like you've mentioned before, it has a surprising amount of notable franchises represented on the hardware. The biggest is probably, at least for me, Final Fantasy, which has ports of the earlier games on the Wonder Swan. And this is actually how I first learned about the device as a kid, because I would read in a magazine about, oh, Final Fantasy II is coming to Wonder Swan in Japan. And I was thinking, how on earth is Wonderswan getting these games, but not a Game Boy? And <laughs> yeah, but, wait a sec. I, we haven't even gotten Wonder <laughs> or uh, Final yeah. Fantasy two yet. <laughs> yeah, but Bandai obviously they have very strong connections and they hold licenses for a lot of major anime IP. Is there any franchise that made you think, "Whoa, I can't believe this has a Wonderswan game"? I think it is Final Fantasy for me as well. Mm. That's definitely the big one. It's the one that I think makes it stand out as not just like. Obviously, the Wonder Swan never captured a truly substantial piece of the market here. I mean, Nintendo very mm. soundly won this generation of handhelds. But they, I mean, it held its own. It was enough to release three different iterations of this console. And I mean, like dozens of colors that it came out in. And Famitsu covered Wonder Swan games every single week. So, I mean, it's, this wasn't mm. a, a nothing system. And I, I do think a big part of that had to do with that it was getting not just these anime licenses, but also some attention from like Square and getting some RPGs on the system. For me, one franchise that stands out is The Ring. There is a The Ring game yeah, on the Wonder Swan, right. which is like, this is kind of what I really like about the Wonder Swan is that it is very peak late 90s and early 2000s Japan in terms of a lot of aesthetics and ideas. And for me, this is kind of nostalgic because this is when I was starting to kind of get interested in Japanese culture. And I understood that, okay, Japan has games that America doesn't have. And Wonder Swan is kind of emblematic of this moment in, I guess, gaming history. So at this time, Pokemon was the biggest thing in the world. And you can maybe argue it still is. But when the Wonder Swan hit, we were in the midst of the first wave of Pokemania. Are there any Pokemon clones or similar games on the Wonder Swan? I mean, there's a lot of Digimon games, if that uh, Yeah, I guess, so. yeah may, I guess it does count. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just a lot of Digimon games. I'm trying to think. I guess I probably should have pulled up a list of Wonder Swan games. I have a full set of Wonder Swan games. I have not attempted to play literally every one of the games yet, although mm. a lot of them, a pretty good amount of them. But I don't think there's anything other than the Digimon games that I would describe as a Pokemon clone. And I do think that had there been a good Pokemon clone, that might have been good for the system. <laughs> Going back to the hardware a bit, you could actually input your birthday, name, and even your blood type into the hardware's memory. Are there any games that actually use this information? I think so. I'm trying to think of an example. I mean, the very silly example that I have is there is a very strange accessory for the Wonder Swan called Mama Mite, which is a pregnancy tracking device oh. and software that is, it's not a game at all, really. It's just kind of like a software cartridge. And I mean, this is the late 90s It is like peak. We are trying to create basically like a smartphone level thing but we don't have smartphones yet if that makes sense right. so exactly. we didn't have computers to carry around in our pocket quite yet other than game systems so there's some mm. companies around this time period that are trying to basically use that and be like okay like if you're carrying around a game boy in your pocket or a wonder swan in your pocket or something like you have computing power what other applications can we use this for and even i mean the wonder swan had a mobile adapter to get on the internet like these were things that they were trying to solve before, again, before we had smartphones. But so I know that that information goes into the Mama Mite, that it takes your, <laughs> that information when you're tracking your pregnancy. But I don't know of any other specific examples, but I'm nearly positive that there are. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a couple of dating sims on the system. I wouldn't be surprised if that factored into it. I honestly wouldn't be surprised if some of the horror games used that information to kind of mm. try to freak you out, you right. know, a la <laughs> Metal Gear Solid or whatever. But I don't know of any off the top of my head. Now, one of the main reasons why I wanted to talk to you about the Wonder Swan is that you don't own one game. You don't own 50 games, but you own every single Wonder Swan game there ever was and ever will be. I want to know about your Wonder Swan collecting journey. How did it start and how long did it take you to get a complete collection? Yeah, it started, gosh, it 
the whole thing took me probably four or five years, mm-hmm. and it started sometime in uh, 2013, 14-ish. I don't remember the exact year. It was just something that I really like this system. I think it's really interesting. I think there's a lot of interesting, not just games for it, but also, like I was saying, like applications like this Mama Mite. There is a fishing sonar for the Wonder Swan. There's that mobile game adapter. There's there's some things on it that I think of as really interesting kind of intersections of, of games and technology. So I just thought, I don't know of anyone that has a full set. I'm not even sure that I trust the Wikipedia list that is the full set. Um, Mm. (laughs) and so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna try to get them all myself. And at first it started off pretty easy because at least at the time, no one really cared about this system, particularly not in Japan. So I was buying big lots of games from Yahoo auctions and just importing them. And anytime I got a double, I'd just resell it and start all over again. And that got me probably like three-fourths of the way there before it started getting truly difficult. But the the system has some just very, very rare stuff for it. And some of it was very expensive, but I don't even mean it in terms of expensive. It's just there are truly not a lot of copies of some of these. So for instance, Mama Mite was years and years of searching. I had saved search alerts. I had <laughs> um, a couple people in Japan who were looking for me, and it took me forever. One finally popped up on Yahoo Auctions, and I paid twenty five hundred dollars for it. Wow! So <laughs> it was yeah, but it's it's super cool. And then let's see what else. So I mentioned earlier that there was like a homebrew game competition. It was called the Wonder Witch Grand Prix, and mm. they ran it three times. And the winners of the first two were they actually had their game published on a physical cartridge um, and this cartridge was sold in super limited amounts so that's judgment silver sword which is a fantastic mm. shoot 'em up and uh dicing knight which is kind of like a, a zelda like adventure game those two were sold in crazy limited quantities they're very rare and then probably the coolest rare thing on the system is it's something called tenori on and it's made by toshio uh, iwai who is He's the guy who made electroplankton. He also he's a he's an artist in Japan. Like he, he's not he is a game developer, but he is mostly right. just an artist of all kinds of of all kinds of types, electronics and lights and sound and music and everything. He's done several art exhibitions in Japan. When the Wonder Swan dev kit was released, which I guess I probably should have mentioned, there was a a consumer dev kit for the Wonder Swan. That's how this whole homebrew scene started. When that started becoming available, he actually made part of his art exhibit using, like he created some programs using this consumer dev kit, and that was part of his art exhibit. And one of them was a a collaboration with a visual artist that was just like little animated like chairs and tables and stuff that would dance when you press the buttons. But the other one was this really cool, a musical toy Mm. uh, using the Wonder Swan, and you fill in different buttons on the grid, and each one of those buttons is a sound that kind of plays, and you can you can make pictures on this grid, you can fill it in however you want, and no matter what you do, it, it will sound nice. Like, there's no way to make a horrible sounding beat or song with it. It's all meant to kind of work in harmony with each other. So he made this for this art exhibit. And people attended it and they were like, this thing is so cool. This little toy you made is so cool. And they were posting on these Wonder Swan fan boards and everything. And they're like, man, I really wish you'd sell this. Like, this thing is really cool. I had such a fun time at this art exhibit. And so Toshi Uai read that and he hand flashed 120 cartridges of this program and (laughs) sold it at the next art exhibit. So there are 120 of them in existence. And that one also took me forever to find. (laughs) It's very cool. It literally, it's a cartridge that came in like a little plastic baggie. It's not like a, it it wasn't sold in stores or anything. You just hand flashed them and and sold it at this event. Do you own a Wonderswan homebrew dev kit? I do. I own both the color one and the black and white one because they did, they did make two. So you can make Wonderswan games and continue the legacy of the if I If I was better at programming in C+, I sure could. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you, I can in theory. I think it would be really cool for someone who is into programming languages that aren't used quite as often anymore and into 
It's kind of a tough thing to get up and running because it's all, you connect it with like a serial port and everything. It's all stuff from computers from the late 90s, early 2000s, <laughs> like things our computers don't have anymore, like a CD drive, for instance. But yeah, once you get that set up, you totally, you can just create some games on it and get them onto this. It comes with a little cartridge, Wonderswan cartridge included, and you can flash the games onto it and, and play them. It's really cool. Do you have a favorite Wonderswan hardware color? Ooh, maybe the, oh, there's so many good ones. They made so many cute yeah. ones. I am really partial to the whole line of the uh, black and white ones that were, there was like a, a mint one, a melon one, um, and then I forget what they called the light blue one, but they're all just like these very cute little um, kind of pastel-y colors that are really gorgeous. They made some really nice colors for the system. I'm just a big fan of the skeleton blue color. Just any type of skeleton case looks awesome. I gotta say all of that. I mean, it's very of the time. It's right. it's the <laughs> same kind of like that iMac or Fantastic Nintendo mm. 64 or Atomic Purple. Like it's all that era that kind of like colored clear tech is so cool. Yeah, definitely. I'm a big fan of that. I really hope they bring it back. I'm sure they will. It'll loop around to where the people in charge are nostalgic for that. So hopefully it'll be back sooner than later. Totally. Uh, I don't know why that's not a Switch option yet. I see people, yeah. like, I know that they've made third party replacement Joy-Con cases that are all those right. clear colors. But Do you have any tips for somebody wanting to start their own WonderSwan collection? Yeah, I would start with a couple of the simpler games, like a puzzle game or something like that. And I would honestly just start with the black and white Wonder Swan. Mm. They're still very cheap. They're like, I still don't think you'll be paying more than 45 or $50 for them. They've gotten more expensive as more people have discovered it, but they're still on the fairly cheap side. And there's a pretty good amount of just very playable puzzle games, rhythm games, even some platformers and stuff for that console that won't break the bank. If you decide you really love it, then you can start getting into like the Swan Crystal or maybe even getting a modded one or something like that. But I think to start, I would honestly tell people to just get like a regular Wonder Swan and maybe a copy of Gunpei or something like that and mm. just see <laughs> how it feels, how you like the form factor and if you're having fun with it to make a bigger investment in it. So the Wonder Swan was released in 1999, but it stopped production in 2003. What was the downfall of the device? Was the GBA just too dominant? Yeah, it just really never got a good foothold in the market. Mm. There were even talks to bring it to the United States, but they all just kind of fell apart. And yeah, it just, I mean, it kind of chugged along the entire time. There was never a point in its life where it was a dominant console or even like a threatening to maybe slightly dethrone <laughs> the Game Boy console. It was <laughs> always kind of niche. And it, yeah, I mean... I don't know exactly how accurate these numbers are, but it seems like it probably picked up only about 8 or 9% of the market share. And again, mm. that's just in Japan. So you haven't even brought it to a larger market like the United States or something. So people, people liked it, but it just ultimately wasn't supported. And if you're a developer... What are you going to make games for? The one that has 80% of the market or 8% of the market? Mm. And it is a little ironic because there are some Wonderswan ports to the Game Boy Advance. Even the Final Fantasy games on Game Boy Advance are adjusted versions of the Wonderswan ports. So some people have been playing Wonderswan games without even realizing it. Yeah, I mean, the Final Fantasy ones are, are interesting because those genuinely are much better on Wonder Swan than they are on Game Boy. There's, I guess, like the PSP versions of them are probably a, a closer analog because you get some more of those fancy effects and stuff on them. I think the Wonder Swan ones are play a little nicer than the Game Boy ones, but they're not in English, so right. <laughs> not much you can do about that. Bandai and other third-party companies haven't really made an effort for a revival or porting the games to modern hardware. Even the 25th anniversary acknowledgement from Bandai was just some new merch, like a shirt and some stickers. Why do you think there hasn't been an effort into at least porting WonderSwan games to modern hardware or releasing some collection? Yeah, I don't know. I have to think that that's probably just a lack of interest or a perceived lack of interest in the Japanese market. Because, again, I mean, I just I don't think that many people in the United States other than us nerds who are really paying attention to what's going mm. on over there, if you told the average Nintendo Switch owner that they're making a Wonder Swan collection, they'd be like, oh, what? <laughs> what is a swan? Like, this, it's not a super well-known 
console. I mean, like you said, you obviously saw it pop up in some magazines and stuff, but it wasn't a big splash over here. So I do wonder, I've always thought that they could do more in Japan, but at the end of the day, it really is a lot of licensed anime stuff. And I just don't know how much of a market there is or how much of a hunger, I guess I should say, is Mm. over in Japan for like, I really miss this, these four One Piece games as opposed to the other four One Piece games on the PlayStation 1 or the other four on the PlayStation 2 or the, you know what I mean? (laughs) Right. (laughs) The Wonder Swan turned 25 years old just a few weeks ago. What would you say is the legacy of the Wonder Swan? I think to the people who were into the Wonder Swan, it has potentially an enormous legacy over there. I mean, that Mm. homebrew scene that I mentioned was, I mean, that created a whole generation of game developers in theory. Like there's, there were people who were able to do really interesting things with that. By the way, that competition wasn't just for games. There were people who made like a GPS that worked with the Wonder Swan. There were people <laughs> a blog about a guy who used a Wonder Swan as like his GPS when he went parachuting. And he had oh. like this whole <laughs> kit set up that his Wonder Swan was like his guide for like skydiving and and parachuting it's a really really interesting console that did a bunch of really cool things and just sadly not a very long life on it even just in the middle of its life there were all kinds of fun things planned for it that just never panned out i mean there's going to be a camera accessory there was going to be a gps accessory there were going to be games for this gps accessory there was basically going to be like a proto pokemon go (laughs) with this gps (laughs) accessory there was like a pac-man game for it and just really really interesting stuff that was all kind of cooking and just never really had a chance to launch so i think its legacy is mostly as like a it's almost like an alternate history it's like what cool stuff could have been and, and what cool stuff was already starting to cook with it that just never quite found the market. But it's such a fascinating piece of technology that Hmm. could never exist again because we have smartphones. There's no reason for a console that can be this versatile and do this many weird things because that's basically just what a smartphone is now. Hmm. (laughs) It's cool to see a video game console trying to do that. All right, final question. Let's say Bandai does release a Wonderswan Classic or a Wonderswan Mini, similar to Nintendo re-releasing the Game & Watch. Pitch it to me. What do you want it to look like? And what games do you want loaded onto it? Oh, well, I think we have learned that it needs to have a backlit screen. Yes. Not even because I think it needs it. I have an IPS modded Wonder Swan. I use them interchangeably. Like, I personally like both, but I'm a big Playdate fan, and everyone hates that the Playdate doesn't have a backlit screen. So I think mm. that's a non negotiable. <laughs> yeah, I think that in a perfect world, it would have kind of that Playdate esque marketplace, and you could still have that homebrew seen on it in much the same way that the playdate does right now but that's a very lofty goal i think the more the thing that would probably happen is just a a nice pretty version but i think it would just kind of have to be the same size basically same form factor maybe you'd have to do something to it to make it just look a little different i guess because all of these classic systems they're either mini or they're you gotta do something but i don't know what Hmm. but i'd want it to have a very similar form factor and then i think that Your collection in there is going to have a lot of the puzzle games. It's going to very heavily feature Gunpei, I think. But I think it would be really cool to include some of those RPGs, even if you don't necessarily get them all translated, just as a a curiosity to kind of boot up and be like, oh, yeah, this is this is really interesting. This is a game I haven't seen before. What what would my dream list of games include? (laughs) I mean, I mentioned a lot of my favorite games already. I think You'd probably have some of the like pocket fighter games or like the Guilty Gear petite games on it. Um, I think some of the musical games on there would be interesting too, like the Beat Mania and Turntablist DJ Battle. Uh, I think you'd want to have some of the just classic everybody knows them games. I mean, there was a Tetris on there, there was Puyo Puyo 2, there's Mr. Driller on Wonder Swan is fantastic. Yeah, I think you'd have to have kind of a mix of like something everyone can enjoy. So a lot of those puzzle games and stuff, and then a couple of surprising things. I do think those Uzumaki <laughs> games would be an interesting surprise to be on there. Like, yeah, yeah. next to your your happy little Puyo Puyos and Mr. Drillers and all of that, it's this, <laughs> these horror games. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm glad I got to chat with you about the Wonder Swan. Definitely an important part in Japanese gaming handheld history. So, Kelsey, where can people find you? I am not... Very on social media anymore these days. I'm actually on Blue Sky mostly, mm. which is just at Kelslow and Blue Sky. 
I am on Instagram at Tentacles. If you are in Seattle or not in Seattle and in the market for some fun, like, video game related stuff you can support my store it's pink gorilla games we've got three locations in seattle and then we sell some merch and plushies and other fun stuff on our website pinkgorillagames.com great and the links to everything will be in the podcast description so listeners check it out kelsey lewin once again thanks for joining me yeah thanks for having me and happy birthday to the wonder swan Wonder Swan was 1999, but what about a year before that in 1998? Obviously, the biggest game of that year was none other than Wrecking Crew 98. I mean, it's got the year in the name. This was released a few days ago via Nintendo Switch Online, and it amazingly got a Western release, so this is the first time that the game has left Japan. Even within Japan, Wrecking Crew 98 was only re-released once before in 2016 on the Wii U. Man, Wii U really had a lot of surprising virtual console games that people had no idea even existed until they hit the Switch. Mother 3 actually came out on the Wii U's virtual console, so did Kurukuru Kururin and the Super Mario Bros. 3 e-reader levels. So thank you, Wii U. Anyways, Wrecking Crew 98 has a pretty unique history. For one, yeah, it's a Super Nintendo game that came out in 1998, mere months before Ocarina of Time, or Metal Gear Solid, or the Dreamcast in Japan. Originally, it was released via Nintendo Power, not the magazine, but instead, in Japan, it was the name of a service where you could bring blank SNES cards, which were sold, to these kiosks, and then you could download games. Wrecking Crew was originally only available through this, but a few months after its Nintendo Power release, it did get a normal cart release. And you might be thinking, is this secretly the last SNES game? No, not by a long shot. Metal Slater Glory Director's Cut came out in 2000, thanks to Nintendo Power. And hey, that game did get a Wii U release, so it will be coming to Switch eventually, one would have to think. An obscure title that is secretly one of the most important Nintendo games ever. Wrecking Crew 98 is not one of the most important Nintendo releases ever, but it is an interesting one. It was developed by R&D1 and PAX Softnica, a studio that supported many notable Nintendo games in the 90s like Donkey Kong 94, Pokemon Snap, and even the Game Boy Hamtaro games. With the release of the Mario vs. DK remake and now Wrecking Crew 98, it is a big year for Mario puzzle spinoffs that harken back to his pre-Super Mario days. He was doing a lot before he decided to be the king of 2D platforming, and one of his jobs was in construction in the original Wrecking Crew for NES. This game is pretty much a sequel, but instead the focus is more on competitive multiplayer puzzle battles instead of a single-player arcade PvE type of experience. It's almost closer to something like Puyo Puyo or Panel Dupon instead of the original game which, for me, is a more fascinating concept because it does join the ranks of Japan-only 90s Nintendo puzzle games that never found its way over here, like Mario Super Picross or Kirby Superstar Stacker, which are both on NSO, so thank you, NSO. The gameplay is fundamentally the same as the original game. You have a hammer, you break things, and you climb ladders. But built upon that is a tile-matching game where you need to match three or more of the same tiles to clear the stage and send junk to your enemy. Whoever's tiles reaches the top of the screen loses, so pretty much the rules of every puzzle game ever. Unlike in the original game where it was just you versus enemies, you are always in a match against someone via split screen. Just the very concept of the game is so fascinating to me, I can't think of another game that had a sequel that just turned it into a multiplayer puzzle game. I wouldn't count Pocket Fighter, since that is basically just a puzzle game with a Street Fighter skin. This still has the gameplay mechanics of Wrecking Crew, but they've stacked on another layer on top of that. Another gameplay element that stands out is that all the tiles are different in terms of what junk they send to your foe. Some of the tiles can summon enemies that are straight out of the original game, others are tiles that push blocks up, others that can put bricks in front of each tile, which forces the player to hammer the bricks in order to reveal them. It is creative in that not only do you have to match the colors, you need to think specifically about what you want to match in order to mess up your opponent. Maybe I'm wrong about this, or maybe this is in some other games, but I don't think a five match of green Puyo Puyo is different from a five match of purple Puyo Puyo, right? I will say that the one that covers all your tiles with bricks is pretty brutal. I don't want to say broken, but since it is a tile matching game, you kind of need to seed the tiles. And you got to manually break the bricks of each one to reveal them, so if the enemy can cover up three or four of your rows, it's hard to come back from. Conceptually, it's quite deep and forces the player to juggle a lot of balls in the air, but this is also what makes it much more difficult than something like Panel the Pond, for example. You have to move Mario, you have to break bricks to reveal tiles, sometimes you have to break tiles to prevent them from reaching the top, 
or to organize them. You also have to climb up ladders to different levels. Then you have to use a crank to shift over the tiles and set up combos. Oh, and also you need to walk across each level and sometimes jump over gaps. This is a far cry from just swapping tiles like you do in most puzzle games. It can be very overwhelming and you can easily get bodied. The AI here is pretty tough and tough early on. It's not like puzzle games where you can easily breeze through the first few enemies and then hit a wall. Everyone is strong here from the get-go. But since there is no real penalty for losing, you can just sit back and kind of observe to see what the enemy is doing to understand the flow of the game and see what kind of combos they're setting up. Due to the complexity of the mechanics, it's not very pick up and play like a lot of other classic puzzlers from this era. But I can certainly see its focus on trying to be a bit more rich in mechanics being interesting to hardcore fans of the genre. Yet, I can still also easily see a kid playing this and being like, what do I do? You can do multiplayer battles against a friend or the CPU, but there is also a brief story mode that has you fighting against enemies from Wrecking Crew and yes, even Form and Spike. The sprite work in all the cutscenes and the game overall looks very nice, and the story segments are kind of in this Yoshi's Island-esque storybook frame, which is pretty eye-catching. Later on in the game, you fight a bunch of odd enemies, including a ghost girl, a rice ball, a dogu, which is an ancient Japanese sculpture. Where are these characters in modern Mario games? Can dogu be in Smash? I also really like Mario's look here. It's his proto Mario Maker gear with the yellow construction cap, but he just wears his normal overalls. They weren't quite ready to give him a full yellow outfit just yet. I just love these types of games popping up on NSO and giving me and others an opportunity to finally try them out. The game is in Japanese, but even if you don't know a single kana, you can still manage pretty well. NSO is just so underrated when it comes to bringing obscure or unknown games back into the spotlight. And thanks to NSO, probably a dozen or so games got their first ever Western release. But it's a neat title to try out and a creative evolution of the Wrecking Crew gameplay formula. Oh, and by the way, you can just play the original Wrecking Crew in this game, just in case you are too lazy to open up the NES NSO app. So if you've got NSO, if you like Mario, if you want to check off another game from your big list of Nintendo titles you've yet to play, Wrecking Crew 98 is at least worth checking out for a few rounds. Good luck versus the Dogu, though. Another game I've been playing that just shadow dropped on Switch a few days ago is the awkwardly named The Exit 8. Just call it Exit 8. That's the Japanese name. It's from the dev Kotake Create, who I believe is a solo Japanese dev. You might have seen this game since it went viral late last year, but it is a first-person horror puzzle game where you traverse a Japanese subway corridor. It got a lot of attention because of its creative concept and its incredibly faithful rendition of a place many people have been to in Japan. I mean, how many subway corridors have I traversed in my time here in Japan? Hundreds? Thousands? It's something so mundane, but we don't often see it represented in a game. Also, you can pretty much just take any mundane place in Japan, put it in a game, and it will still grab people's attention. Who knew mundanity could be so interesting? The concept of Exit 8 is incredibly simple, but oh so clever. It is very much a, why didn't I think of that type of game? It's a blend of walking simulator, those spot the different types of puzzles, and first person horror. You are trying to get to exit 8, but first you need to pass through exits 0 to 7. After going through the corridor once or twice, you realize that you've looped back to exit 0, and then you're greeted with a sign that says, if you spot an anomaly in the corridor, basically something unusual or odd that normally isn't there, turn around and go back. Otherwise, if it's normal, proceed. The loop of the game has you walking down the same corridor over and over again, having to decide whether to proceed or to turn back. If you mess up, you start back at exit zero. The corridor itself is purposefully nothing special. It's something I've seen countless times. White tiles on the walls and the floors, some posters on the left, some doors on the right, and another city dweller passing by. You don't think much about what it looks like the first time through, but as you play the game, you realize that every element needs to be carefully inspected if you are to make it to the end. I don't want to ruin what the anomalies are since the whole point of the game is to identify them, but they range from blatantly obvious to incredibly hidden. I wouldn't say it's a pixel hunt type of game since it's nothing so obscure like the font of this poster is slightly different, but there are many types of anomalies that are hidden in plain sight. There are plenty of times where I failed and legit had no idea what the anomaly was until I encountered it a few more times and thought, oh. Once you see that the next sign has you start at exit zero again, you can just go back to the corridor and try to find the anomaly. Your progress is still reset, but you can use that knowledge for next time. Also, it seems like none of the anomalies that you turn back on repeat, only the ones that you ignored or didn't notice. So the game does feel fresh during its short runtime. You aren't constantly seeing the same scary thing over and over again. 
The game has a good mix of very clever hidden changes in the hallway and immediately noticeable ones that will make your eyebrows flare up. It is very fun to turn the corner, see the hallway, and immediately be like, nope. I said it's a horror game, but it relies more on a creepy atmosphere instead of jump scares. A lot of the changes are supposed to be scary or freak you out, but some are a little funny too. Nothing pops up two inches from your face and kills you, but I think you can initiate a game over if you interact with some of the more blatantly ominous anomalies. I'm not a horror gamer at all. I will never touch another Resident Evil game, but this has a good blend of being a bit creepy without making me throw my controller in the air. The whole experience is about an hour max. When you beat the game, you get a sign saying how many anomalies you have left, so if you choose, you can just go through it again to clear them out. I had two left after my first playthrough, then I found all of them my next time around and got a nice little sign thanking me for finding them all. It's definitely worth encountering all the anomalies, and like I mentioned earlier, there are no repeats until you clear everything, so you can easily find the ones you missed unless you are a speed demon and finish the game in one or two runs. I think it is theoretically possible for someone to beat it in maybe 10 to 15 minutes, but most won't have any idea what they're even looking for and what kind of anomalies are even possible, so I'd say for most people, it will take maybe an hour to clear. The game is only $4 though, so do your dollar to hour calculation and see if it's worth picking up. But for me, I had a great time with the Exodate. It takes something very specific about Japan and turned it into a creative gameplay experience. It's incredible that someone took what's essentially an Unreal demo, something you practice with and play around with when making a game, and flesh it out into what's essentially a brand new gameplay genre. I have to imagine like Suica Game, another Japanese title with a very simple concept that hit it big, there must already be imitators springing up. Even the developer already announced a follow-up, Noriba 8, where you are inside a typical Japanese subway train. He says that it's not exactly like Exit 8, so it might have some new twist on the gameplay, but it's going to be an instant buy for me if it captures the same vibe as Exit 8. The dev is also working on another game, Strange Shadows, where you run away from giant monsters. I might skip that one. But Exit 8, absolutely worth putting on your radar. So hopefully I won't encounter anything too creepy the next time I pass through a subway corridor. Drunk people, I can deal with. That's it for games, now for the news. Well, I already kind of spoiled the news by talking about Raking Crew 98, but that along with Super R-Type and Amazing Hebereke are now available for Nintendo Switch Online. This is also the first ever Western release for Amazing Hebereke, which is kind of like a party arena fighter. It was already on Japanese NSO, so I played it there, but if you don't have that, you can now play it on your Western NSO app. A Japan-exclusive NSO game is Marvelous Another Treasure Island, the directorial debut of one Eiji Aonuma. I've always been meaning to play it, and now is as good a time as any. I definitely want to cover it on the podcast in the future, hopefully with a guest, so look forward to it. There was also an indie world this week. The Exit 8, which I just talked about, showed up in the Japanese indie world, but not in the US one despite being available worldwide. I think by default, that's the most interesting thing from the show. Honestly, nothing really caught my eye. The big announcement is that SteamWorld Heist 2 is coming, but I've never played the first one, yet I have heard great things about it, so maybe I should just wait for this one. But no Wildermyth on Switch, no Silk Song. Those games exist, right? It's not just some shared delusion. I feel like there should be more news. There was an Endless Ocean trailer that told us stuff we already know. Did I miss something else in the Nintendoverse? There's a G-Mode Persona 3 game coming soon. That's neat. These news segments are really short when there's no big plushy announcement. So let's just wrap it up. Thanks as always for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast on your favorite app. Leave a five-star review as well. It really helps with visibility. The podcast is also available on YouTube, so like and subscribe there as well. I'm on Twitter, Threads, Blue Sky, Instagram. Just search for Tokyo Game Life or find the links in the podcast description. If you like the podcast, be sure to share it with your friends and on social media. If there's anything you want me to talk about or cover, don't be shy. Just message me on Twitter. The next episode will be on May 5th. See you next time. Matane. Matane.